The Innovators Network. Welcome to the Killer Innovation Show, the longest continuously produced podcast in history. Each week, Phil McKinney brings you the insights and strategies to amplify your creativity and innovation skills. Here's your host, Phil McKinney. Welcome to this week's Innovation Show. We are wrapping up the series of interviews that we did on the mobile studio, on the bus, uh, related to the Tech Expo Show in Philadelphia. Today is the last and final interview, which timing works out because now um, we are going to be at CES here soon and doing a whole new set of interviews at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. But today's episode is the final one from Tech Expo. Our guest today is Sandra Howe. I've known Sandra for many, many years. She and I both served on the board of directors for one organization. And Sandra has a long history of the industry. She used to be at Cisco. She was at Aris Technetics. She's on the board for a number of smaller startup companies. Most recently, she is the board chair for WIC. W-I-C-T. If you're not familiar with it, it's Women in Cable Telecommunications. It was started in 1979, which I'm very proud of from the standpoint of our industry having had such a long history in creating organizations like WIC to support women in the industry. Uh, Sandra is finishing up her third and final term as the board chair for WIC. In today's interview, we talk about a wide range of things, but we tend to focus in on was around innovation timing, how to get the timing right, being too early, too late when introducing new technologies, and also around collaboration, collaboration within industries, collaboration even within competitors. And so those are kind of the core two basic things, but we covered a wide range. One interesting statistic that we did talk about was semiconductors. And how many semiconductors are used actually within the uh, communications industry? Broadband, voice, mobile, fixed. If you add that all up, the majority of all silicon produced is actually used in the communications industry, which I found pretty uh, pretty interesting. And we, we got into that discussion, so you're going to want to listen. And at the end of the interview, uh, Sandy also shares a piece of advice. So if you're an innovator working on that new idea, here you have an opportunity to listen to somebody who's been around the block. She's been involved as part of advanced technology groups at leading companies. Here's her advice on what you should do, the first step you should do with that idea that you have. So you want to make sure you listen to all the way to the end. Before we hop into this week's episode, get that favor to ask, follow, like, and share. Follow us on social media, keep up with and be part of the conversation. Like the show, give us a thumbs up, give us a rating wherever you get your podcast and share. Share it with others so others have an opportunity to hear and get the benefit of the content. Um, as I've mentioned in the past, all of our content is now available over at the innovators.network. The innovators.network. That is now not only where my content, both the podcast, my writings, articles, videos are all aggregated in one place, but also other contributors, such as Kim McNicholas, who uh, used to be an, uh, a reporter, staff reporter with Forbes magazine and Forbes video. Uh, she's an Emmy Award winning um, reporter with her video work um, with Forbes. So you want to check out also what Kim is doing. Her focus is on innovation in healthcare. So hop on over to innovators.network and check that out. But let's go ahead and let's hop into this week's interview with Sandra Howe. This episode is sponsored by Zoom. With Zoom, you can streamline your communication, collaboration, and creativity all in one place. Zoom is the market-leading platform that provides video meetings, voice, webinars, and chat across desktops, phones, tablets, and conference room systems. To learn more about Zoom and sign up for your free account, visit KillerInnovations.com slash Zoom. Sandra, 
So, Sandy, what you've been here at the show now the whole week. I've seen you around, running, running. You know, everybody's been going crazy trying to go booth to booth. So, what, what's your take of the show? Well, it's great to be back in person, which is <laughs> probably is the, what everybody that, is saying. That is the most common answer I'm hearing. Like, oh. You're in 3D. I can see you. And, I can hug you. I and can... it's nice to put names and faces with people I've met just by video over mm -hmm. this time of lockdown. Have you had the experience of thinking you know what someone's going to look like, and then when you see them live, they're like, I didn't realize you were so tall. Exactly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that does happen. Yeah. Uh, so... Good show, seeing a lot it's, of great stuff. It's a great show. The technology, we really, as an industry, need a hub. And very thankful to the work that Cable Labs and the SCTE are doing to create a place where we can talk about thought leadership, new technologies, share ideas, work on standards. There's so much need, as well as sharing the actual believe there's a lot of value in the case studies mm -hmm. and real world so yep. to hear an operator that might have tried this new technology and hear what it's like <laughs> because it never quite deploys the way we think it will when we're designing the products yeah i mean i was having a conversation i guess it was no it was it was that at the dinner after the chairman's reception i michael powell was sitting next to me and michael and i were talking and we were talking about the the, uh, the secret weapon of the industry is the collaboration and the willingness to share. Now I came in from the outside. I was not did I didn't didn't grow my career into the cable industry. I came in as a, I guess a late bloomer. Albeit I've been here ten years, but in cable years that's still young. In the, you know, but it is the secret weapon. And in events like this where people come together, it doesn't matter what operator you are or what vendor you are. The willingness of the industry to be as transparent, I try to explain it to people and they just, they don't believe me. Well, I also believe, again, Cable Labs has helped with that with some of the standards bodies and places that, you're right, in different standard bodies I've worked with, you don't have kind of this collegiate feel that we have. And in our industry, too, when you think about all the things we've innovated and put on this hybrid fiber coax network over the years, and I remember first talking about high-speed data, and we were like, is the, you know, can we really clean up the upstream plant to make it even work? And again, it's through collective work together, sharing best practices, sharing what was learned, what didn't work, what we found. Uh, that's what has made all this innovation happened from high-speed data to voice, and now some of the things we're doing in wireless are very exciting. Yeah, it's, uh, well, what I found interesting is it's just the, one, the, just the sheer number of new products that have been, that came out, obviously, because the engineers were working hard all through COVID. It wasn't like anybody was sitting around not doing exactly. anything. Um, so I think it was a little bit of a backlog collective to get that out, um, which is all interesting. Plus, the number of new companies, new companies that are new to the industry that are here. That's That has been exciting for me. And companies that might have been in the industry or really large in other parts of the world, very active, that now they have a presence. There are some big booths that I'm like, wow, they're really making... Um, a presence here in North America, and they're going to be successful coming in and working hand in hand on these industry standards and issues. Yeah, it was interesting. I was I've been, you know, talking with a bunch of the, the those companies, and a couple of them have been on on the show, um, coming from Europe to the mm -hmm. U.S. <clears throat> and then, you know, part of the conversation was about the the, the is it different? Is it the same? Hard? Easy? The common thread, though, is is the openness of the industry to at least take a look at, try things, you know? Yes. This is an industry that's willing to experiment. And if it doesn't work out, okay, move on, try the next thing. Right. And sometimes in our industry, and I so believe, and I've seen this happen in all the different companies I've worked in, you we come up with solutions, but we sometimes are 10 years too early. <laughs> And, you know, we do have so many great engineers and very thoughtful of what we can do with this robust network. 
that has a lot of capabilities and it's the network that keeps giving and we do come out with things and I've seen business units sadly shut down and I'm like there's going to be a need I see it I see it but it was also so early and it's hard uh, for companies to keep those businesses going to make it so they're there in 10 years but hopefully they still have a lot of that IP. Yeah, it, it it is a it is a common challenge, right? Of uh, you got to be careful about not being too far on the front edge of the the leading edge because you can uh, you can spend a lot of money educating, but you don't get to reap the rewards. Exactly. Right? It's always the you know is it always better to be maybe slightly of a fast follower, or as we say, the difference between a good idea and a great idea is rarely the idea; it's the timing. You know, getting the timing aligned with the market. It is. And I think that's also key is just the timing, but also figuring out the right partnership and the right group to work together to start small trials and prove out those trials and the successes and and then even build the business cases around it. Well, and I think, again, I think this points out to another uniqueness of the industry because, you know, at least in my experience of being in here the 10 years, the, for instance, the, 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 what we call the, the mid-tier or smaller operators, um, the larger of the smaller operators, I guess is one way to describe them, are willing to, to do more trials and try more things with vendors and suppliers. Now, in most other industries, the big, a big guy in the industry would say, well, that's a small guy. It doesn't matter. But in our industry, the big guys talk to the smaller guys and say, hey, how'd that work out for you? A lot of people would never know it, but the Wi-Fi mesh work that's now pretty much prevalent started with the mid-tier operators. They did it first, and the big guys were like, great, you guys do that and then report back, and then we'll figure it out. We won't have to to do it. So a lot of the, the partners that the mid-tiers used to do the early Wi-Fi mesh are now the partners the of, the big, guys of, of the large guys use. And it is interesting of this because of the cooperation, the cooperation on the research, cooperation on, on deployments, the support that each other gives each other. You, you gain scale that you would never be able to like buy the merge up to be give, become big enough to equal the scale that and that you, industry brings. And you have to have those types of trials. And, and it is about figuring out how to scale it and also not impacting uh, consume you know your end c- customer too much <laughs> you don't want to disrupt their service that they expect to be on now I mean broadband's almost a lifeblood for everyone uh, everyone wants on the internet as fast as possible whenever they get someplace well getting on the internet and you know what used to be during you know daytime hours when everybody's at work and the kids are at school if you had a little hiccup in the network or you're doing a network upgrade okay now God forbid, you know, there's an eight second blip, you know, the, 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 the call centers explode. Oh, exactly. And now all like network maintenance, which could have been done during the day for residential, now is all at 2 a.m. to avoid, you know, any customer perceived, you know, issues with the change out. It's, it's, it had COVID changed the industry. It did. I, I like. The one thing that came out of COVID and having worked in video conferencing for actually at the very start of my career, it made really doing the video calling happen. Everyone used it. Everyone quickly adopted it. We would never have had still the adoption that we have now if it wasn't the force of all of a sudden we're all secluded. We can't be together. And the only way I can see you and we could have our, you know, NCTA board meeting is to have, uh, you know, by video Yep. and and make sure that we're compliant with our bylaws and video. It's interesting now because I think we all have some video fatigue, (laughs) Uh, but nevertheless, it is such a good way, uh, you know, to have some first early intros if you can't physically get there. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. The, uh, I would get all these phone calls early in COVID about, um, hey, we're we're uh, playing around with we're 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 thinking about using this thing called Zoom. Well, Zoom's a sponsor of the show. Zoom has sponsored the show for eight years. Been <laughs> use, you know, I was an alpha user. Eric, who's the founder at Zoom, was a friend. Um, and but you're right. I mean, when I was at HP, we we created Halo, which became mm-hmm. then went to 
Polycom sold it. And then recently HP bought Polycom back to get that. And then Cisco Telepresence came after. Well, I worked with WebEx and uh, at Cisco, WebEx and Telepresence. Oh, so then when Eric, products, Eric, so. Was, Eric was the VP of engineering for WebEx mm-hmm. for many years. Um, so I had the Halo group reporting to me, and then it got sold to uh, Polycom. You know, and you remember those back in those days, and they have to build a room. And people and didn't conf- even want to use it always, too. It was like. <laughs> but yes, you. Well, it was interesting. And paint the room the right color. Yeah, well, in, in, in our case, um, Halo be- was part of a collaborative co-innovation work with DreamWorks Studios. So DreamWorks Studios actually designed the Halo rooms. So if you ever walked into a Halo room, the outside walls actually slope in to give you the 3D optical effect. The ceiling actually sloped down. The lighting color was very specific. The distance from the last chair to the back wall. I mean, it was... It's a soundstage. You're basically on a soundstage, which made for an amazing experience. But one of the things you talk about, like social engineering, one of the interesting things that we did in Halo, on Halo that you don't see in any other system, and I actually think it might not be a bad date to bring it back, which was we never show an image of the room, your room. So you never can see yourself on a, uh-huh. on a screen. Yes. You know, versus... You find, like, even in a Zoom room, people, fo- you know, they got 12 people in a room, they're focusing on their square. If you follow their eye tracking, they tend to be looking at themselves versus everybody else, and people notice it, mm-hmm. the, the, the eye gaze. It's another kind of social engineering piece of, and again, you talk about fatigue, you know, how much time do you spend on it, and it's interesting to see. What people did in the early days of Zoom to the later days of Zoom, pretty you know people would, you know, not turn their camera on, you know, whatever. Yeah. Now you know they turn the camera on and their hair sticking out, and, you know, and they're like, I don't care, you know, I'm on Zoom. That's why know? I'm staring at my video sometimes. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're right when you think about the the large systems that we used to use, and you know, telepresence, we would dictate size of the rooms to the customers to make the best experience possible very much like the you know halo solution the color of the paint we did all this research on what color made people look the best in the room so you had three colors to pick from and i just remember going oh my gosh for facilities this is a lot of work and again that's where technology it constantly leapfrogs it goes beyond and we now have zoom and i was also shocked during covid my mother that's 80 years old, was Zooming to church. But I was so shocked she figured it all out and she just went and did it. And that's, again, that huge adoption. And when you're bringing new products to market, it's about figuring out how to get high adoption quickly. And that's when you have real success. And that's also why they've been successful. Well, yeah, and Zoom, you know, I think Eric and his team did a phenomenal job of getting what I what I refer to as grandma simple. Mm-hmm. Is it grandma simple? If my wife can do it, yeah. Then then you you've achieved the grandma simple, and you will get broad adoption. Right. It, any kind of a you know there there is always this technology uh, intimidation factor for the average consumer. At HP, we would refer to it when coming up with a new product is will it will it play in Iowa. Yes. It doesn't matter whether it plays in Silicon Valley or plays in Austin or Boston or New York. Will it play in Iowa? Because if it plays in Iowa, then you got a, Then you got a. You got a great product. If you need a some special expertise, not a good fit. Well, from you know, I led for a while the global products uh, re- for retail at Aris, and you know, so that was all the modems and the routers and then some of the mesh products, and it has to be easy. Yep. And and so you that's the key piece is it like you said is it going to work in Iowa it has to be so easy that insightful you aren't questioning and then you know from years of working with the operators on these install kits and I remember working on the first DVRs and we thought customers are never going to be able to install a DVR back in the day and we figured it out uh, again from that kind of collegial experience mm-hmm. uh, i rode in a lot of trucks to learn how to make that easier uh from the you know product side but you have to have it easy 
Well, I think this, I think, you know, the example you're giving is another one that I think is a result of COVID. If you looked at the, the, the rate of self installs that just shot through the roof and back to the collegial, some of the players who were pretty far down the line, like Shaw mm-hmm. and others that had done a lot of prep work, they basically went to the other operators and said, here, here's, here's the step by step. Here's how we do it. Here's what we tell our drivers. Here's how we, our facility centers operate. This is the, this is the actual materials we stuff in the box when we ship it and they give it away to everybody to, to help because it was all, as Michael Paul says, it was all hands on deck for COVID. And this was, what do you call it? Our, our, our Winston Churchill moment. Mm-hmm. It's our, it, it, you know, finest hour. Better, you know, we gotta we gotta do what's right, and uh, but you look at like the self installs, people who'd never thought they would be able to like hook up. They look at a modem, a modem. The word modem freaks them out, you know. Well, again, it's kind of that mass adoption of Zoom. One, I also know from a business side, as much as the operators wanted to have self installed, not all of them were comfortable with certain services being self installed, so. It was a blend of that all of a sudden now people need more broadband in their home or they're signing up for broadband because using their cell phones not going to cut it when, you know, mom and dad are home working and the kids are going to school at the same time. And this they don't want you to come into the house to add the broadband because you might be contagious. So it it was just, as you said, a, a perfect storm to force now I think the majority of the operators all want to be self-install as much as possible. Everything's being looked at that way, and then people are so willing, more willing now to try it. Right. And that is where what happened with Zoom. And again, it goes back to it has to be easy. It has to, as you said, Shaw helped with the right coat. You know, I know I've seen different kits with like color coding, and you know. One, two, two here's three, what you right, go you connect in what order. And it has to be that way. It has to be simple. Well, it's like at HP, if you ever open up an HP printer, it's always this uh, simplified graphic for the setup. And it may be like a fold out. And it's one, two, yep. three. And it's drawings. There's no, you don't have to read. You can, oh, I'll take that phone, okay, put that, plug that in there, or I plug that into the now wall. Now I plug outlet. it into the, yep, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and then, but, you know, from from your perspective, I mean, one of the challenges that I see with a lot of innovation, though, is is the engineers get all excited about solving really complex problems. But then you're on the other side saying, okay, that's great, but then you got to make it simple. There's this, There's always this little friction. And I also think, too, with innovation, you have to figure out the business case and the financial drivers, whether it's saving an OPEX or creating no, you new don't. revenue. The technology's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so much cool technology, and again, but, but, some of but, it before time. Yeah. But the, we're ready. Uh, but, you know, over the years, having worked on, like, advanced technology teams and with so many of the great CTOs in our industry, uh you have to just a great idea until you can help make it a product and figure out what that business model is. It's the business model that's going to drive yep. a lot of the mass deployment and then keeping in mind how to make it as simple and easy and, and it has to just work. Well, part of this is it has to be also allow for a healthy ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and this is, a, well, you know, we've, we've had this conversation in the industry for a while. And I come from an industry in the PC world where it's not a healthy ecosystem. You know, 90, 94% of the margin is held by two players in the industry. And everybody else is battling over the other 6% of the margin left out of the entire value chain. Right? And... The 6%, that's the people who have the brand in front of the customers are fighting over the 6% margin. Right. Right? And so, therefore, you you lose vendors. You know, vendors don't have enough to survive on. How do you make that? So, you talk about the business case of innovation. Talk about, think. how do you think about that in the context of it? Because, it's like, you were at Aris, so you've got suppliers to Aris. We need to keep the silicon suppliers viable yes. and value. 
eras now Comscope in the you know in their play, and then you got the MSOs, but the MSOs eventually have to build a network that they can then provide, sell, take revenue in with enough margin to then pay Comscope errors that then Comscope pays the component. I mean, it's a complex ecosystem problem. Well, and, and you know, I've spent a lot of time through COVID on supply chain. I've worked on the Chipset Act. Uh, I'm very passionate about having dual sourcing as much as possible, mm -hmm. uh, especially in silicon. That's, you know, so much of, and, and in, you know, our space, depending on the device, it can be the majority of your, your bill of material to right. build that device. So silicon is a big swing in your cost. And you have to have two players, in my opinion. And, and also, we have to, as an industry, also think how we're positioned against other industries that now need more silicon. Like everyone's hearing about the automotive industry, but they don't realize our industry, the telecom industry, uses about 60% of all the silicon, whether it's wired, wireless, or the device in everyone's hand. Mm -hmm. And automotive at this point is using about 17%. And, you know, but all you hear about on the news is the 17% of the cars that can't get their parts. And yeah, but it may, it's, it's a great video shot of this big parking <laughs> lot of trucks that can't be sold because they're missing a chip. But think about it. Through COVID, we needed connectivity. Yeah. And it was this industry that stepped up. Our networks solved almost twice as much traffic in any one year added to it. Yep. And they, and on a whole, most part, I was really proud of all the designs because I was like, wow, they were surviving <laughs> with more load than we thought ever on this type, this current design. Oh, I, 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 remember, I remember that first week we did um, 7 a.m. calls with every CTO around the world at 7 a.m. for the first almost two weeks, two and a half weeks. Until we were sure that everything was stable and the network performed fantastic. I mean, it was. I wouldn't say we were surprised. We uh, knew we had overhead, but not that much overhead. Well, basically, as you know, you know, broadband networks are typically built with two-year capacity plans. So you're building for two years. We ate two years of capacity in in ten days. So in ten days, with everybody coming home. And then the students start to try to figure it out. You know, we had a little bit of a blip in the first couple of days, but by day 10, day 11, day 12, after the shutdown in the U.S., we'd eaten up. And then it pretty much stayed. Or as we say, you know, peak time in the broadband network is Sunday night. Right. Right. That's the big night. That's the that's when everyone's home. Everybody's home. Everybody's streaming Netflix or whatever. So the joke we started saying was, is every day is Sunday. You know, because that was where we were at. We just went and then just stayed. Well, the other thing in the United States, um, we should be very proud of. There are places in the world that did have some initial outages and they couldn't yep. handle the capacity. And, and the, again, the great thing about the way our network's designed is it's relatively, in some pl cases, it was easy to do some upgrades and yep. get them back in line with where the network had to be. And we in the united states we kept our service going yep. and it was a lifeblood to all of us if we were all home zooming we were all it was our only way to the outside world for the longest we were all i'm sure watching the news and whatever they had to say next about you know how you were going to get COVID and how to keep away from it uh it was it was a very interesting time with so much demand on the network and the resiliency of it and very very proud of our industry for yeah. what what docs is how it held up and how we thought the overhead of the network was designed well and I, you know and again i also emphasize the collaboration because oh. then yeah, you know, we did we had the the friday call so every friday for a year every friday 7 a.m every cto was on the call along with their heads of network engineering and then people would we we'd be going through the report out before NCTA posted the numbers, um, so we were transparent. We posted right. every performance in the United States is by every state, and then countries started doing it. We were helping the Canadians, we helped the Europeans post their information. Um, but what it was is, is like you said, okay, we've got a congestion, and 
Northern California, what's the issue? Um, and then, you know, we had a couple situations where someone needed um, a piece of equipment but couldn't because of all of a sudden right. couldn't get and any, we aren't getting any boats in. Couldn't get any boats in from China. So completely other members would say, okay, I've got, I got, I've got that in my warehouse. I'll, I'll get it, I'll have it shipped. You'll have it first thing. We'll, we'll do overnight directly to you. So they were helping each other. Like, okay, we got to go solve an LA problem. We've got a Seattle issue. We got a Chicago issue. It was issue. amazing what got dusted off in some warehouses too. And you know, it, it wasn't, wasn't it? necessarily the most cutting edge, but it worked. And again, it was great engineering minds that would think, oh, we could do this and you know, repurpose. Well, well and the nice thing about the network is is the backward compatibility. So you could take a a Doxus three O <laughs> and stick a stick a device into the network if you <laughs> or, needed to. Exactly. Well, there was a couple of Doxus two things going on. I was on. gonna say I think there were some Doxus two being deployed. Right. Yeah, for some some consumers. Or they, redeployed that were in a warehouse, right? Right. They were they Doxus were... two modems that nobody ever thought they would ever use again, but you're you're selling to customers who never had broadband and all they needed was a hundred megabits. You can get right. that on Doxus two and it's backward compatible. So sip them a Doxus two modem. When you can't we, get when you can't get anything else, we had some of those in in our yeah. warehouses. And again, I think this gets back to a little bit of the planning and you know, talk a little bit about. I mean, you you've been in the industry for a long time, but you've also been everything from a advanced technology group and then running the the, the leadership role. When you think about the innovations like that, planning for that, you know, for the. The what ifs, what could happen? How do you plan for those kinds of things when you're thinking about, you know, products and serving customers and customers being the MSOs and then ultimately them serving the end users? Well, I go back to there's still so much to the you've got to plan and test in the mm -hmm. field. And every product I've ever worked on how we thought it was going to work on paper and design. Once you go deploy it, there's always adjustments. And that's where you really kind of learn what you have to do. So again, it's, it's getting these trial. You have to have these trials and testing period to kind of work out things because as much as you think about all this backward compatibility and you're always thinking, well, this is going to work. It doesn't always work like you plan when you start to right. design a product. Exactly. It's one of the reasons why the it's always I, I enjoy uh, observing the interoperability testings that happen at, at Cable yes. Labs in, in Colorado. When you got vendor shoulder to shoulder, but they're willing to work together. Vendor A, CMTS, plugging into vendor B, modem, hey, it's not working. Okay, well, why? Let's get the scope out. Let's figure out. Yeah, I, right. oh, no, no, you're supposed to be sending this. No, 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 you're supposed to be acknowledging with that. And then let's work it out. And they make it work. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then then it takes a little bit of heat. But reality is when you're doing those field trials. Yes. You know, you, know, you think That's... you got it in the lab, pristine <laughs> environment, you know, go go stick it in a pedestal someplace and see well, how it operates. And find out a squirrel chewed on the coax somewhere. <laughs> so. Well, I don't know if you were... If, uh, you weren't at Showcase, the uh, Tenji Showcase this year, but um, I think it was Charter. Uh, they were they had set up a demonstration with uh, with an HFC infrastructure. So they, we had all these big coils mm -hmm. of, of coax, right? And then they uh, inside of Cable Labs we had this squirrel figurine, <laughs> and they stuck the figurine of this squirrel with facing right into the into the, the into the coax. For those of you listening, if you want to hear about squirrels and coax, I'll invite like Tom Williams in on the call, and he'll give you all the funny the story, pain. all the funny <laughs> stories of uh, Varman, uh, who for some reason loved the coating on coax cables to sharpen and, their teeth. Yeah, it sharpens their teeth, and uh, so it's uh, it's it, it turns out turned out we did a very good design of creating coax that particularly squirrels really. Uh, really enjoy so but it is that real world yeah until you get it and and to get it to scale uh mm -hmm. as anything is you have to try it and and adjust and adapt uh and it's the persistence to keep going through yep. and adjusting and adapting yep so as we wrap up this uh, this episode 
What's the one piece of advice you would give to an innovator that maybe has an idea, has got that spark? How do they move the how do they move that forward? Well, one thing I've always found is when you ask, you know, if you have friends that are in the industry you're in and you ask, do you have could I have some advice from you, Phil? I'd like your advice on something. I don't think you would ever say no. Nope. Uh, and so that's a very powerful to know you can get advice because it is good to hear from other inputs. And then from that advice, you can then start working. Could this be a product? Could this be a solution? Because uh, it's not always a, a solution. Being innovative and innovation is not always resulting in a product or solution. It can be how you go to market on, mm -hmm. on something. Yep. And, you know, it's always listening. I find to your end consumers and hearing what they have to say and, and adjusting. And it's at the end of the day, there's a lot of persistence and you've got to understand the value that you're bringing. And again, if it's a new product that we've worked on so many as we are working on Doxus 4.0 right now, uh, you know, what's the business case? How much can the device cost? You know, that it doesn't necessarily fit in the model if a device is, you know, three times what's being deployed today. Yeah, exactly. Great advice. Sandy, thanks for taking the time to, to join us. Well, thank you. It's great to see you and be on the bus. <laughs>